Welcome to Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Our show today, will there be a renaissance of the KMT, the Chinese Nationalist Party? Our guest is Mr. Eric Huang, formerly the head of international affairs at the Nationalist Party of Taiwan. Welcome to Asian Review. It's good to have you here. Thank you, Bill. Glad to be here. Great. Well, um, I guess everybody knows that next month there's a big election coming up in the, in the Nationalist Party, the Kuomintang, and uh, the point of that election is to select a new chair. So can you give us a little insight on that and maybe tell us a little bit about some of the candidates? Right. So um, currently, Hong Xiu Jun, the sitting chair, is still fulfilling Ma Zhou's four-year tenure. Mm -hmm. Ma resigned uh, in November 2014, and Miles took over by Eric Chu, who also resigned by January of last year. So the, the, the election we are hosting in May 20th, um, that person elected will have a four-year term, a full cycle term. A as full cycle party. term, okay. And currently we have six candidates. Okay. Uh, run, it's, a, it's a record high. Um, <laughs> the KMT are under attack of not having candidates running for chairperson. And this time, that's not an issue. We have six of them. So now uh, people care, um, can group them into two groups. The first camp, uh, the top three is uh, Chairperson Meng Shouzhu, former Vice President Wu Dunyi, and former Mayor of Taipei Hao Longbei. <coughs> mm. They believe in Camp A. Um, so it depends who you talk to, uh, different people will tell you who is the, le the leading candidate among these three. Okay, There's no consensus there. Um, but the, the, the three that you can like, camp we have Steve John, um, former vice chair, and we have former legislator uh, uh, Pan Wei Gang, and we have um, who was also a former legislator for a long time ago, uh, Han Guoyu. So these three are behind. And personally, I don't think these three uh, will ever have a chance of catching up. So you think it's it's going to be the, the, the person that ultimately becomes the next chair will be from Group A. Definitely. So within that group, do you have, want to make any predictions? Um, so as, as people might know, um, the largest voting bloc within the KMT are the Huang Fuxing, the veteran faction of the party. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this faction is supporting Hong Xiu Zhu, um, vast majority of them. Uh, so that's her strength. Uh, Wu Dunyi's strength is the local factor, factions of the KMT. That's his supporters. When so you, you say local factions, you mean like the branches, the, the party branches throughout Taiwan? Right. So, the, um, so, for example, the city councilor level, their people, uh, townsmanship, uh, uh, file and rank KMT members. So these guys, especially in central and southern Taiwan, that's where uh, Wu Dunyi has more stronger supporters mm. than mm -hmm. children. So um, if, if I would have to put my money on this, which I'm not, I would place it on Hong Xiu right now. That's very interesting because, uh, you know, one gets the impression that she wasn't a terribly popular person. And... Um, um, seems to push cross-strait relations to somewhat of excess. Uh, so I'm, I'm a little bit surprised about that, but um, I, I suppose that in her own way, she's a very sincere person. Well, you, you're right. Uh, first of all, um, with all due respect, uh, Chair Holm is a very passionate person with a strong character. But Bill, I think you point out something that worries most of us, that is, KMT's base, its uh, voters, its uh, party members are out of touch of mainstream Taiwanese opinion. I think that's true. And I've had the opportunity while I was in Taiwan to talk to a lot of mayors of Taiwan. And uh, some of them uh, were, you know, uh, in your party and other people in the central committee of the party. 
And um, I, I can't say they always said the most complimentary things about her. Um, and, uh, and so I'm, I'm a, just a little surprised to hear that she's the, the leader. Um, you know, it does seem to me that the Kuomintang has suffers from this, is a lot of people perceive the Kuomintang to be a party that cares only about cross-strait relations, cares only about big business, and um, doesn't really pay too much attention to anything else. And that that perception, rightly or wrongly, is, is hurting the Kuomintang. It is hurting and coming down. Um, so you, you look at for the past eight years, okay, um, how did President Ma won the first election in 2008? Uh, KMT, the coming down, promises voters that cross race stability uh, means economic growth. So these are the two pillars of our party. And what's missing now is that people believe when we are talking about economic, economic growth, we are talking about uh, for big companies and not for the middle class. Oh, that's, wow, that's a good point. That's where um, you know our party need to rebrand our images and convince the Taiwanese people that we are for economic growth and we are for the middle class. And how do we achieve that? We need cross trade stability, um, not the other way around. Oh, that's a very interesting point. I'm I'm glad that you uh, you know pointed that out. Um, you know, uh, uh, just a just kind of a side question here that uh, popped into my mind. The mainland, of course, is always interested in cultivating Taiwan and, you know, persuading it to unify with the mainland. And they come up with various policies to win the hearts and minds in Taiwan. And one policy they had was um, if a county or a xian was uh, ruled by the Kuomintang, then they would give that particular sin all kinds of advantages, pump mainland tourists into that particular sin. But if it was a sin or a municipality uh, controlled by the Democratic Progressive Party, the mainland would not allow any mainland tourists to go there. There would not be any business. There would not be any economic benefits. And I, I'm wondering what the... Um, what the position of the Guomindang was on that? You know, Bill, I can't um, speak for the party um, in my capacity right now since I have already stepped down from my sure, sure. position. But I can give you my analysis on this. Okay. Um, first of all, if you look at eight years ago, um, there wasn't this divide, right? Eight years ago, the, the communist, Chinese communists dealt with the Kuomintang-led uh, cities and the DPP led cities, mm -hmm. right? So that's when they bought a lot of fruits mm -hmm. and from you know southern and central Taiwan. Mm -hmm. So why are we having this problem here? We need to ask the question. The reason this is happening now is the Chinese are trying to force the Taiwanese because President Tsai wouldn't accept or acknowledge the nineteen ninety two consensus. That's that's the essential problem here, right? So now we need we need to ask ourselves. So the Chinese is proving to us that um, they can do this as means of sanction, and maybe uh, in the future they can even escalate into a higher sanction towards the Taiwanese. So we need to ask: Is this in their favors, right? This if 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 the Chinese wants to uh, maintain peace and stability with Taiwan, would this play in their favor? The answer is no. Um, from my personal perspective, I think if the Chinese would offer the Taiwan any economic benefits, they have to offer it to everybody, not just to a certain region or a certain places that's led by a particular party. I think that's a good point. You know, I, I uh, when I go to mainland China, I, I like to um, uh, converse with, talk to, exchange views with uh, China's Taiwan experts. And I find them very divided on this policy. Some think it's a great idea, some think it's not a very good idea. So there doesn't seem to be um, much of a consensus amongst um, China's Taiwan experts on that particular policy. 
what what this is is China has proof to the Taiwanese. If you don't accept one China principle, what we could do to you. But what this does not do is it does it doesn't make unification any prettier to the Taiwanese. It's almost like holding a gun to one's head, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, it's a. Yeah, I, I don't think that's the way. For the, if the mainland wants to really unify with Taiwan, I don't think that's the way to go. Yeah. It, they're not make. They're not making it any more attractive to the Taiwanese the way they are doing it, and on the contrary, they are pushing the Taiwanese away. Yeah, I think at a time when the Taiwanese sense of identity deepens and deepens almost on a daily basis, that's really, I, I don't think that's really in the mainland's interest to pursue that sort of policy. Um, yeah. Um, but um, let's see here. Um, well, maybe this is a premature thing to ask, but does the KMT have any strategy for the future, or is this all going to depend on who gets elected as chair? It, largely, um, if you were talking about short term, largely will depend on who the next chair is. Short term being four years, uh, okay. between five and four years, between now and 2020's presidential election. Okay. But in the long term, I think KMT's policy platform are pretty straightforward. Okay. We are a party for uh, economic growth. We are a party for educational reform, we are a party for the middle class, and we are a party for, um, <coughs> excuse me, and we are a party for um, redistribution justice, right? And as part of all these po different policies, we need to be a able to maintain a healthy cross-strait relations as well as a healthy U.S.-Taiwan and Taiwan-Japan relations. Mm. Uh, that's what we stand for. Yeah. And is the policy going forward that can bring Taiwan the, uh, the best outcome and the best interest? Mm. That's an interesting point. Uh, I think this would be an ideal time to take a break. Um, so we'll be back in about one minute. You're watching uh, Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. My guest today is Eric Huang. Uh, he used to be head of the international section of the Na Chinese Nationalist Party, the Kuomintang. And we'll be back in one minute. Aloha, this is Kelihi Aquino with the weekly Ehana Kako. Let's work together program on the Think Tech Hawaii broadcast network, Mondays at 2 o'clock p.m. Movers and shakers and great ideas. Join us. We'll see you then. Aloha. Hi, I'm Cheryl Crozier Garcia, the host of Working Together on Think Tech Hawaii. Join us every other Tuesday from 4 p.m. to 4.30 when we discuss the impact of change on employees, employers, and the economy. My name is Mark Shklov, and I'm the host of Law Across the Sea. And Law Across the Sea is a program that brings attorneys who have traveled across the sea and live in Hawaii or are staying in Hawaii for a time to talk about their travels, where they're from, where they're going, and bring it all together because really we're all connected some way, although we travel across the sea. So I hope that you'll tune in and watch our program. Thank you very much. Welcome back to Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. My guest today is Mr. Eric Huang. Uh, Mr. Huang uh, formerly was head of the International Liaison Section of the Nationalist Party, the Kuomintang. Right now, he's a graduate student uh, at Johns Hopkins uh, School of Advanced International Studies in Washington, a really great place, uh, fantastic school. Um, OK, let's see here. Um, you know, as I see it, um, the, the, you know, the DPP, the Democratic Progressive Party, has always been accused of being a very factionalized party. But as I look at today's Kuomintang, it's pretty factionalized itself, uh, isn't it? I mean, you know, you have the, the Bantu Pai, the local factions, and then, you know, the Ma faction, and I guess you would call it the Lianjian faction, and uh, 
the young and the old, the old sort of diehards and the younger people. Uh, I, I mean, I, it's a party that really could use a little more unity, isn't it? You know, unity is the word um, in the past that the KMT would use whenever there is a discourse um, policy front. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, Bill, um, the factions you describe within the KMT now, which they do exist, and I see that problem as well, but what I'm pointing out is these divides within the KMT are not from ideology differences. Okay. They are just for either um, personal factions um, or under different personnel, different leaders, for example, President Ma or uh, former Chair Lian Zhan. Um, so this is different from um, the device you see within the DPP where they would, you know, debate and argue on the ideology from of the party. Um, so within the KMT, I see this problem um, being even bigger because a lot of people will argue that KMT doesn't really have a strong foundation on ideology. But, um, but do, I, I do want to point this one thing out. Uh, Chair Hong Shou Zhu, um, her cross-strait policies is now totally different from the rest of the party, uh, what she believes uh, on China. That's a very interesting point you just made, and I, I think that's something we better slow up on and uh, talk about a bit. You say her cross-state policy is different than the mainstream of the party. Um, my guess is um, she's a person that wants unification now. She wants a peace treaty with the mainland. But other people, it seems to me like Hao Long Bin, they're saying, well, there's, some, there's not a consensus in, in society for that sort of approach to China. So before we can do anything, there needs to be a consensus. Am I on the right track there? Well, right. Um, I, only part that I, I would maybe uh, talk more about is I'm not sure if Hong Zhou wants immediate unification, hmm. but she wants some form of unification in a foreseeable future right and versus others they still work under the framework of the 1992 consensus mm -hmm. which they believe that no matter what in the future what happens in the future if and if there will be unification that will be done through the democratic process by the taiwanese people mm. that's very interesting do you have any notion of what she would like in a peace treaty? Um, I, 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 I briefly worked on her presidential campaign uh, in 2016 before uh, her candidacy was replaced. Mm -hmm. And then I moved on to work for Eric Chu's presidential campaign. I believe um, in the treaty that she proposed that, uh, to, to, with the Beijing is that she wants to sign a treaty uh, under three constitutions, uh, one frame constitution, uh, PRC's constitution, ROC's constitution, and there will be peace um, uh, between cross trade for 50 years. So no more. Let, let's revisit what you just said there. She wants a, 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 a treaty that's based on three constitutions. Did I get that right? Okay, yeah. the ROC, Republic of China Constitution, the PRC Constitution, and what was the other and, one? And, and a constitution that's above both countries. So um, different people might read this differently, but the way I always understood is it's like European, European, European Union. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So this is something bigger than both countries. Mm. Hmm, that's very interesting. Uh, very, very interesting. I, I always felt that if there was a peace treaty between um, China and Taiwan, that the, um, the mainland would insist, that China would insist uh, on the obligation of the Taiwan military. Um, is there any sense to that? Well, I, I believe that's what Beijing will want, but I think uh, what Hong Shou Zhu is saying is basically 
um, everything else in Taiwan should remain the same, except that under this constitution framework, uh, this roof, you will, that Taiwan and mainland China are united. Mm. So Taiwan remains its function of everything. I, to me, that sounds like a long shot, um, but maybe I'm just pessimistic. <laughs> um, you know, it seems to me when you're talking about the base of the party, right, for a long time, the Kuomintang ruled uh, on the basis of the support of the military, the bureaucrats, and the teachers. But I think the last election showed that that so we call it traditional power base, is beginning to erode. And it's not nearly as strong as it used to be. And in fact, some of the members of those three pillars actually went and voted for the DPP. Is, does the um, Kuomintang have any ideas or strategies to, to reformulate that base, the three pillar base? So we, what we're looking at is, I don't think there is a systematic change of voter behavior in voter behaviors. Mm -hmm. The voter blocks that you just mentioned. Okay. What happened in 2016 was that these you know, so-called public servants were very deceptive, especially when government Ma, uh, when President Ma tried to push reform in their pension system. So, um, in a sense. They voted for a DPP, or they decided not to vote uh, in punishment of the KMT. Um, but if you look at um, public pollings now and some of the recent public movements, um, the you know the people you just mentioned are pretty much still against the DPP government. Mm -hmm. um, so these traditional KMT voters um, in the future, I think, might very well vote for the KMT. They will come home. So they will come. Okay. Right. Okay. Hmm. That's very interesting. Well, um, there was some talk before in the first part of the show. You mentioned factions, and, and, and it seems to me when you talk about factions in Taiwan, it can be interpreted in a whole lot of ways. It can mean factions within a party. Uh, it can mean uh, factions at a very local level of um, of politics uh, in Taiwan. Um, and, and traditionally, it seems to me the, the KMT has done pretty well with these factions. But as I heard your comments, you're sort of, I think you're suggesting that these factions are not necessarily as loyal to the KMT as they used to be. Is that true? Yeah, I, I think. Um it's definitely true. Um, so let, let me walk walk you through this. So the traditional factions of the KMT are what you would call the people that um, cling onto the powers, the uh, the people of bandwagoning, right? So when when KMT was in government for a long time, um, it makes sense for these factions to stick to the KMT because that's the gov that's the party in. Right. So as you can see, these so-called factions go smaller and smaller as Taiwan becomes a democracy. Right. So what KMT, the problem KMT is facing now is that the party lacks a central ideology to group everybody together. Right. But I don't that, that's think a very, very good point. I'm sure our, our listeners will appreciate that. It, it, there is a lack of a central philosophy within the party, isn't there? And I don't believe these factions are the key points for KMT to return to power. What we, what's essential for us to do is to find that central ideology that can grow the party back together. And um, that is what I talked about earlier before um, in, the, in the first segment of the, the program. That is economic growth, middle class, and education. That's yeah. very interesting because I think most people would not associate the Kuomintang with the middle class. Um, Which is not true, Bill. Um, okay. So in the Zhang Jingguo eras and the Li Denghui eras, that's when the middle class has grown in Taiwan. 
that's when the KMT has had its highest popularity in Taiwan ever. Mm. Good point. Good point. Um, you also mentioned transitional justice uh, in the earlier part of the show. And uh, it seems to me transitional justice um, or the pursuit of transitional justice by the DPP is really hurting the, the, the KMT. It is, and um, I, I, I'm uh, <clears throat> I'm afraid that I have to say that DPP um, is using this as a political tool rather than uh, let history be history. Um, I have said this in, in in the past that you know KMT is in the best position to deal with this past issues. That if Taiwan were ever going to achieve true transitional justice. KMT is the party to do this. So, in other words, you're saying that the DPP is using transitional justice for political ends. I, 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 I am afraid that is the case. Okay. Um, the transitional justice, for the benefit of the listeners, deals with the, how should I say, the straightening out of what are perceived to be excesses of the past. Um, but that also brings up the question, and we're getting down to our last couple minutes here, um, about party assets. And this is certainly, um, some people might lump that in with transitional justice. I, I tend to see it as a bit different. Um, and, and it seems that the DPP pursuit of the party assets issue is really hurting the KMT as well. It is, but um, Bill, for, for just for you, and for the, our audience to understand, the new generation of the KMT, we do not wish to keep the party assets. Okay. We do believe that one, um, even though Taiwan had its history and there are reasons why KMT have these assets, we believe now Taiwan is a full-fledged democracy and we should uh, give up these assets so we can compete fairly with other parties. Um, but the question, Eric, you know, I, I hate to do this to you, but I, I, I've just been notified our time is just about up, and that clock is, is, is very unfriendly sometimes, and I think it's a bit, been a bit unfriendly to us today, but I want to thank you for joining us. Uh, it's 11 o'clock at night in Washington, D.C., where uh, Eric is uh, joining us from, and we really appreciate him for staying up maybe a little bit late or postponing his bedtime. And thank you so much for joining us and giving us some insight about the current situation of the Chinese Nationalist Party. And thank, thank you. you. And thank you for having me. You're quite welcome. And thank you for viewing. Uh, we'll see you the next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.